I want to thank you all for coming to this uh, event on digital privacy. My name is Jonathan Hodge. I'm a department head uptown in Norfolk Central Library, and I've also been leading a task group on the implementation of a Toronto Public Library digital privacy initiative. Um, so this event marks the beginning of that initiative. It's an opportunity for the Toronto Public Library and its members, which is all of you, um, to educate, advocate, and agitate for privacy to return to the center of our interactions online as well as in real life. Um, so uh, you didn't come here to talk to me. Um, you didn't come here to listen to me. You came here to listen to all these folks. Our next speaker is Brenda McPhail. Brenda is the director of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association's Privacy, Surveillance, and Technology Project. project. She is currently working to develop a program focused on protecting privacy rights while creating public awareness about the importance of privacy and the ways in which it is at risk in contemporary society. This includes privacy in relation to national security and intelligence surveillance, privacy and private sector information sharing practices and policies, and privacy in the social context of existing and emerging technologies. Please welcome uh, Dr. Brenda McPhail. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this wonderful panel. Very pleased to be here with both Chris and Alison. As Chris mentioned, we've divided up the topics, and so I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes talking about private sector surveillance, the ways that businesses and companies um, collect and use personal information of Canadians. Very briefly first, in case you don't know, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association is an organization that's been around in Canada for more than 50 years, protecting fundamental rights and freedoms. We work often through the courts, trying to make sure that our laws are actually protective of Canadians and that the, way, the rights that are enshrined in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms are reflected in the legislation that's passed by the government. And then we also have an active education and outreach and advocacy program. So, there are two versions of a talk about private sector data collection the short version is about 30 seconds long. Everything you do online, every site you go to, every interaction you have is tracked, stored, and analyzed. Mm -hmm. Privacy in the online world in a corporate setting, in a corporate context, is illusory. Mm -hmm. I think Oscar Wilde, and I thought it would be nice to bring a literary reference to a <laughs> library presentation, said it beautifully when he said, it is very sad that nowadays there is so little useless information. He, of course, was speaking many, many years before the onset of the internet. Um, but his words really ring true in our internet age, because even the tiny little pieces of information about you and about the way that you behave online and as you move through physical space with your tracking device, as Chris was discussing, um, things that you might not think are particularly consequential or wouldn't add up to much, Things like how long you spent on a site, or whether you clicked on something, or where you went after you looked at one thing. Um, all of those things are considered potentially valuable, and they're collected. A more up-to-date up sort of model, instead of going back to Oscar Wilde, um, can be Pokemon. We live in a Pokemon society, and companies want to catch them all, every bit of data. And they'll say, even if we don't know what we're going to do with it now, chances are really good that in six months we'll figure it out. So, in the next few minutes, I'm gonna just talk very briefly about a few of the ways that we're tracked and how companies are using information. And then a little bit about what rights you have and what kind of laws we have in Canada that are supposed to protect you. And at the end, if I have time, I'll tell you extremely briefly about a court case that Canada's involved, or that CCLA is involved with, where we're trying to stand up for Canadians' privacy rights. So, how are you tracked? There are lots of ways that you probably know about, if you were to think about it for 10 seconds. Things like loyalty cards, where you're, you know, th what you're actually doing when you have a loyalty card is trading information about your purchasing habits in return for points or benefits. Um, online shopping, everybody probably understands that when you're shopping online, a record is being kept of what you buy. And companies are not shy about explaining that to you. In fact, you know that you gotta use that information to provide you with things like recommendations for more things that you'd like to buy. 
Ways that you might not think about or be quite as aware of in terms of ways that companies can track you are things like in physical space. Increasingly, they can use location tracking in, through in-store Wi-Fi to figure out where you are in a store or where you are in a mall and, and potentially at some point, depending on ways that they have of connecting you and your, to other data they have about you, you know, pushing, adver pushing ads or trying to entice you to come into their store. Or looking at the ways that you move around their store to help them figure out how to better develop marketing techniques. Um, video surveillance and behavior analysis is another way that information is collected um, in physical space. And then, of course, when you're browsing online, basically everywhere you go, there are ways of tracking you through tracking cookies and beacons and different little technological ways of figuring out what you're, what you're doing, what you're looking at, how long you spent looking at something, what you clicked on, and where you've been. And then, of course, everything that you post on purpose on social media, depending on how you've got your privacy settings set up, um, is also fair game for someone who wants to know more about you and your behavior and your likes and your dislikes. And it's important to understand that the business model of the internet is fundamentally built around collecting and using that information. It's kind of a truism to say that if you're not paying, you're the product. But it actually goes further than that, because in many cases, even if you are paying, you're still the product. And one of the most worrisome things, I think, about that is that companies sometimes go to fairly great lengths to obscure that fact. Um, the way to figure out how companies are using your information is to take a look at their privacy policy. Has anybody ever actually plowed through a privacy policy? <laughs> Two, that's a higher average than usual. <laughs> There's actually some awesome research recently put out uh, where students were asked to evaluate a website and embedded in the privacy policy was a promise that they'd hand over their firstborn child to the company. <laughs> Almost none of them noticed, despite the fact that their task was to evaluate the site. So even people who could be expected to be motivated to look, they don't. <laughs> But if you, if you had ever managed to plow through one, you might notice that a lot of the items aren't incredibly clear. They tend to focus very much on why they need to collect information about you. And it's about providing you with more service, better service. The more information you provide, they will often say, the better service and more personalized service we can provide to you. Where they get fuzzy is what they're going to do with the information after providing the service or beyond providing the service. So if you see code words like, we may use your information for research, or a little bit more clearly, market research, that's a sign that they're going to use it basically for whatever they want. <laughs> you might see mention of third party partners. And often in conjunction, so that means that they're going to potentially sell your information to somebody else. And often in conjunction with that notice about third party partners, what they say is that they're not responsible for what happens to your information after it's given to a third party partner. So they're basically saying the information that you gave them for a particular purpose is going to be sold to someone else. They will benefit from that. You have no control and they're not responsible for what happens to it after it's passed along. I don't think it's, um, confusing why we might find that problematic. But beyond the obvious, Canadian privacy laws function largely on a consent model. The idea is you're supposed to have some control over your personal information, and companies are supposed to you know, tell you how you, can, how you can exercise that control, and are really duty-bound to provide you with some degree of control. But Increasingly, the kinds of policies that we're seeing on online sites really render that control illusory. So for example, on a popular online grocery shopping site, the policy actually says um, that you agree to every, everything that they say in their policy and allow them to do anything that they want to do with your information simply by virtue of visiting the site. You don't even have to have looked at the policy or have made a purchase on the site. The policy actually says, if you've been to our site, you've agreed to our use of your information. So much of our lives are spent online. 
how do we make privacy protective choices when those are the kinds of policies that are set up on the systems that we need to use to go about our daily lives? Now, to be fair, it's important to point out that not all data collection by private sector companies is bad. It can actually be really convenient to browse around and see advertisements for things we want, not things that we don't care about. Um, but the problem is, the thing that we're concerned about is that the way the information is going to be used isn't necessarily always for your benefit. It's not always going to be to show you ads for things that you want or to provide you discounts or coupons. Um, it can also be used in ways that can have consequential harm to your life. And a huge part problem with that is that because you don't actually have any reasonable way of knowing who's collecting your information or what you're going to do with it, again, you don't have any control of what those consequences might be. That means that the personal information you provide to companies down the line can impact you down the line in ways that you really have no way of anticipating as a consumer or a citizen. So for example, one way that companies use data is in something called predictive analytics. You've probably all heard about the concept of big data. Basically, they use statistical methods for analyzing large data sets and try to find connections between the different pieces of information they have about you. And then they use those connections to predict your behavior as a consumer. So, I mean, a really simple example is they can probably figure out that when it's rainy, umbrella sales go up. But they're also capable of a lot more advanced conclusions. Um, so in the US, for example, Target used predictive an analytics to figure out that women in the second trimester of pregnancy were more likely to buy unscented hand soap. It's really hard to imagine how that came out of it, but it was a very useful observation for them. And you can imagine that none of the women in the second trimester of pregnancy who received coupons from Target for unscented hand soap had a clue that their shopping behavior and that the shopping behavior of many women before them had led to them receiving that offer. Now, that, I mean, that's a pretty benign example. Whether or not you get a coupon for unscented hand soap isn't really going to affect your life that much. Um, but what if they're analyzing behavior like spending habits, like who you associate with on Facebook, and there has been a case like this recently, and using that information to decide whether or not you deserve to have insurance? The stakes get big a lot quicker. And it's not just about individuals that these analytics can be used to draw conclusions. They can also be used to draw conclusions about societal groups. So they might draw conclusions about you as an individual based on how people in your age bracket or gender bracket or socioeconomic group um, behave, whether you're a man or a woman, what neighborhood you live in. And the way that those decisions are made, the kind of assumptions that those categories that you get put in cause companies to make about you then can reinforce some of the differences that we have between social groups and our society. Um, lower income individuals can be put on lists identifying them as credit risks whether or not they've ever committed any financial transactions that would, would lead someone to that conclusion. That might mean that when it's time to go get a mortgage they don't get the best rate because they're on the wrong list. So in that way, predictive analytics and targeted advertising can actually reinforce the kinds of inequalities that we could probably all agree we don't want to see in, a, in our society. And when you give organizations your information, you're helping them draw those conclusions and letting them know what kinds of assumptions they can make about you. So I think one of the big issues here is about choice. The way that the current system is set up, we don't have a lot of choice in how we interact online. Most of these contracts, when you go to a site, it's a take it or leave it. You want to go on the site, you agree to the terms. Um, an example of that in the last couple of minutes is a case that we're working on at CCLA called Duez versus Facebook. And it's about a woman in British Columbia who was very upset that Facebook was using her picture and name in targeted advertising for her friends. This was a policy that Facebook had. It was buried, it was buried in their terms of service that they could do this. Um, but she found that was a really profound violation of her privacy. And she wanted to take Facebook to court. She got stalled at the very first stage because 
again, deep in the contract with Facebook is a clause that says that if you want to sue Facebook in court or advance a claim against Facebook, um, you have to do it in the location of their choice, which is in California. So right now, last week, CCLA intervened in the case, which went as far as the Supreme Court of Canada, arguing that when they're in Canada, Canadians should have the benefit of Canadian privacy law. Um, we would think and hope that that would be a given. It's not. That's something that we have to fight for. So to wrap up, I think that I'd like to agree with my colleague Chris that while there are definitely technological solutions to this, a big part of the problem is social and it's legal. We have privacy laws in Canada that aren't being followed and they're not being well enforced and we could do a lot better. We also need to think about the way those laws are structured and whether the idea of consent can actually be a meaningful concept in a world where it's almost impossible to negotiate the terms of the contract and it's a take it or leave it kind of transaction.